Thanks for joining us on this amazing weekend. My name is Mingo, and one of the easiest ways that you can partner with us in ministry is by sharing this post or going to our YouTube channel and actually sharing this message with your friends and your family. Our mission is to be people helping people find and follow Jesus. And oftentimes that happens in the most unexpected and yet totally timely moments when someone is tagged or forwarded one of our services. Today, we've got an amazing message from our friend Hosanna Wong and a worship set that I know is going to bring us together as a church wherever you're watching from and with whoever you're watching with. Let's get into the service. I searched the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise Treasures the fame I never know You came along So you came along And put me back together And every desire Is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid. Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. You've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place. Mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing better than you. 
There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can Happy 4th of July weekend, my friends. It was an amazing weekend for me in the Moultrie House because the 4th of July was my birthday. That's awesome, dude. Happy mm -hmm. birthday to you. Thank you. And also, awesome time to celebrate because the summer is in full effect with student ministries, isn't we it? We are in full effect. We are full sending it as a student ministry here at Torrey Pines Church. We kicked off this past week and uh, we had students gather together in a safe environment. We actually enjoyed a few hours this past week at La Jolla Shores, in the sun, catching waves, doing all of that amazing stuff. And we also relaunched our Thursday night Bible study for high school students. So, lots of things going on with the high school ministry and middle school. We haven't forgot about you. If you're a parent of a middle school, we've got something happening on Sundays mm -hmm. from 12 to 1.30 p.m. right here in the grass in front of the student chapel, spread out, lots of space. We're having a safe environment and Bible study for middle school students as well. And if you want more info on that, just info, just email info at torypines.church. That's in addition to in addition. the weekly Students United content that you guys are putting out on YouTube, exactly. right? Exactly. Wednesdays for high school at 7 p.m. and Saturday at 5.30 p.m. Students United YouTube channel. Go check that out. We have a full-on message and service for them as well. That's super cool. Listen, I want to give a super shout out to everyone who came through this last week and actually participated in our blood drive. You guys booked up the whole day that they were here and they collected enough blood to save over a hundred lives. Isn't that awesome? I, I love it. I love it. It's so cool how we can be the church that way. Just remember that next, our next food distribution is happening twice this week. Yep. July 6th from 11 to 1 p.m. and the 8th from 1 to 3 p.m. That's right. This is our regular distribution and it has been growing every single week. So as the pastor, I want to say thank you for being the church. Thanks for coming in, picking up boxes for friends and families, and just representing the love and the joy of Jesus so consistently. I bet there are at least two or three people out there that you can think of right now who would be super blessed if you were to pick them up a box or two and just share this simple gift with them. Uh, to get more information on this and how to serve and distribute with the team, uh, just text Be the Church to 67076 or email us at info at torypines.church. Yeah, honestly, none of these things would be possible without your generosity. So thank you for being a generous and even more importantly, a consistent community when it comes to giving financially. If you haven't already used our text to give option, simply text generosity to 67076 and follow the steps and join us in generosity this week. That's right. You can also go to torypines.church or the best way is just to download the Eastlake Network app. Uh, select Torrey Pines Church as the location and just give through the app. Mm. It's easy, it's secure, and it just makes an impact every single week. Yeah. You know what else is awesome on that app is that's where you can actually follow along with the weekly message notes and you can get access to messages from seasons past and get the latest info on regathering, which is actually happening Woo! right now. Yep, we are in phase two. We've made it, we've made it to phase two of our regathering plan and the neighborhood churches are launching. 
Mm -hmm. They're forming all over our city. It's a great way for us to experience church together in community in a safe environment. Yeah, listen, we're still looking for people to form teams and to launch churches. So if you've got a space or let's say you have a heart uh, to host a weekend service, we'd love to connect you and get you in rhythm with dozens of other teams and dozens of other leaders who are already leading neighborhood churches. So if you want to get involved, just text phase two to 67076 or just email phase2 at torypines.church and we'll get you all set up. So many amazing things. Listen, don't for one minute think that we've slowed down or we've lost momentum in this season. We're more missional, we are more generous, and we're more engaged than we've ever been before. That's right, so uh, we have a few things for today. We have a super good talk from Hosanna Wong, uh, week four of Faith Forward. So, let's jump in. Let's go for it. This week, my 10-year-old niece, Eden, texted me a video. It was a TikTok video of a girl dancing. And she said to me, Auntie Nana, I thought this girl was you. I watched so many of her videos before I realized it was not you. And I said, how do you know that's not me? That girl looks just like me. That girl dresses just like me. How do you know that's not me? And she said, I realized it was not you once I remembered that you can't dance. Thanks, Eden. Clearly, words of affirmation is not this kid's love language. We will be working on that. But my niece thought this girl could be me. She resembled me. She had some characteristics like me. But to my niece, the definitive difference between me and this girl was the difference in how we moved, the difference in how we danced, and the difference in how we acted. In that moment, when she saw the difference of our actions, she realized these two things are not the same. As a church network, we've been going through the book of James and talking about having a faith that doesn't just believe in Jesus, but a faith that causes us to act like Jesus, to move like Jesus, to live like Jesus. And for many of us, we hear live like Jesus and we think, heck yes, I wanna walk on water. I wanna cause storms to calm down. I'm all in, that sounds dope. But when we're talking about living like Jesus, what we're talking about is living like Jesus would if he were in our shoes, if he was in your position, in your family, in your job, in 2020, we want to live like Jesus would live. So throughout this series, we've been talking about practical ways that we can have an active kind of faith. And today I get to share with you about how we can actively show respect to everyone. We're going to be in James 2. James 2, 1 through 4. My dear brothers and sisters, fellow believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, how could we say that we have faith in him and yet we favor one group of people above another? Here James is saying, how could you say you have faith in Jesus and still be favoring one group of people above another? These two actions are not the same. He continues to say, suppose an influential man comes into your worship meeting wearing gold rings and expensive clothing. Gold rings, come on, this man is bougie, can literally make it rain. He's laid back with his mind on his money and his money on his mind. This guy's got money, this guy has status. And then he says, also a homeless man in shabby clothes comes in. If you show special attention to the rich man in expensive clothes and say, here's a seat of honor for you right up front, but you turn and say to the poor beggar dressed in rags, you can stand over here or sit over there on the floor in the back. Then you've demonstrated gross prejudice among yourselves and used evil standards of judgment. Gross prejudice, evil standards of judgment. And maybe you and I cannot relate necessarily to giving partial treatment towards someone who is rich as opposed to someone who is poor, but maybe you and I can relate to wanting to hang around the most popular kids at school and not wanting anything to do with the lesser known kids at school. 
maybe you and I can relate to wanting to go out to dinner with and rub shoulders with people with large networks, lots of Instagram followers, people who can maybe advance your career, but not wanting to spend as much time with people who can't give you anything. People that might need something from you, not wanting to go out to dinner to people that might need community or need something from you. Maybe you and I can relate to being partial in situations like that. And here James is saying, In verse eight, your calling is to fulfill the royal law of love as given to us in this scripture. You must love and value your neighbor as you love and value yourself. Here, James is quoting Jesus. Jesus said this, the two greatest commandments are love God and love others. James is quoting Jesus. And then he continues to say, for keeping this law is the noble way to live. But when you show prejudice, you commit sin and you violate this royal law of love. He's saying when you play favorites, when you're prejudiced, when you give partial treatment to people because of external factors, that is a sin. I wonder if all of us knew that that was a sin. Did we all know that showing favoritism was a sin? I wonder if we knew that because the world makes it feel so normal. The world loves its list. The world loves picking favorites. The world loves their categories and exalting and worshiping certain humans because of external factors and disregarding other humans because of other external factors. The world loves that. And this mentality has broken apart our world. But Jesus came into this broken, divided world to tear down walls, to break down barriers, to tear apart lists. Jesus came to tear down all of the barriers and walls that were created by the sin of hate and the sin of favoritism and the sin of prejudice. And he came to instead, listen to this, this is what Jesus's mission was, to restore what is broken inside of us, to restore what is broken between us and to restore what is broken between us and God. That was Jesus's mission. But others throughout history have loved labels, They've loved walls, they've loved barriers, they've loved their lists and their categories. And that is the anti-Jesus mission. And sadly, this mentality has found its way into the history of the church. Church people have not always gotten this right. In fact, the first generation of the church didn't get this right either. That's why Jesus talked about it so much. He cared about this so much. That's why James is talking about it right here. And that's why we're still talking about it because our culture still struggles with the same thing that they struggled with back in the day. We love playing favorites. And here James is saying, How could you say that you have faith in the one who came to unify and yet be causing all of this division, working against the Jesus mission? These two actions do not line up. Romans 2.11 says, God does not play favorites. God does not play favorites. If God does not play favorites, then who do we think we are? When we devalue human life, when we look down on someone or think less of someone's value because of their race, background, economic state, job status, marital status, clothes, body type, or any other external factor, we are not just saying we think we are greater than this person. We are also saying we think we are greater than God. Romans 2.11 says that God does not play favorites. So who do we think we are? Do we think we have more authority to decide the value of human life more than the one who created human life? My friends, this is not just a question of how do you see others? This is also a question of how do you see God? What is the sin in my life that causes me to think that I have more authority than the one who created me. So how can I have a faith that actively respects everyone? I need to first recognize, recognize 
what is the sin in my life? What is the favoritism in my life? What is the prejudice in my life? We're talking about sin. Sin is anything that is short of God's best. Sin is anything that separates you from God and separates you from the full life God has for you. So what is it that we need to recognize in our lives? Because to have a faith that actively respects everyone, we have to first recognize and then we have to repent. If you're taking notes, I encourage you to take notes for this talk because it is so important. We need to recognize and we need to repent. I love talking about repentance. It is so important to talk about repentance. I think for many of us, we grew up, depending on how you grew up, we learned this word repent like it was a, a term that meant you are wrong, stop doing wrong. You are evil, so stop doing evil. When really that does not define repentance fully. To repent means to turn away from a way of life and to turn towards a new way of life. It's not just about what you stop doing. It's about now what you start doing to change your mind and change your direction. When Jesus told people to repent, he wasn't just telling people, stop doing what you're doing over there. He was saying, Look at me, see what I'm doing over here. The call to repentance from Jesus was an invitation. It was invitation to himself. See how I move, see how I live, see what I'm like. Repent from how you've been living. Repent from the sin that has separated you from God and come towards me, follow me, and I'm gonna help you get closer to God. My niece Eden told me, Auntie Nana, I can help you dance like this girl if you want to. It's a very important part of TikTok. You pick the dance you want to dance like and you study the moves. You spend hours trying to figure out how I can dance like this person. And the same thing is the same in our lives. Whoever we are focusing on, whoever we are staring at, whoever we are spending all of our time looking at, we will start to live like them. So whose life are we staring at? Who are we pointed towards? We read here in Romans 6, 17 and 18, all your lies you've let sin tell you what to do. But thank God you've started listening to a new master, one whose command set you free to live openly in his freedom. This verse is saying, first you were following this person. You were looking at these ways. You were learning these moves, but then you repent and you turn towards Jesus. Now you have a new master and now you can see a freer way to live, a way to live that has more hope, that has more peace, that has more joy, that has more freedom. And we start to learn the ways of Jesus, how he moves. We learn his words. We're in the Bible learning what he says, his ways, his perspective. Then he starts to rub off on us. Then we start acting like him. And the word of God says that it is actually our actions that will show the world who we've been following. It is our actions that will show the world who we've been looking at and trying to learn from. We learn in John 13, 35, Jesus says this, Everyone will know you as my followers if you demonstrate your love to others. Everyone's gonna know who you've been following once they see your actions. And we don't want to be Jesus people. We don't wanna be Christians where people can see some things we're doing and say, okay, they kind of resemble Jesus. See some things we're posting and saying, okay, they kind of speak like Jesus and then see how we're acting, seeing how we're loving or not loving people, and then saying these two things are not the same. We wanna be people that are known for following Jesus. So we have to be known for people who act in love. Do you remember a couple of months ago when this pandemic began and everyone online was nice to each other? <laughs> What a time, what a time, what a time. We had all of this camaraderie together. We're in this together, fam. People were on Facebook saying, I have half a roll of toilet paper. Who needs a roll of toilet paper? I have 10 squares of toilet paper. I can give one to 10 families. Who are the 10 families? Who needs one? You, 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 you. We felt a sense of community and unity together. And that lasted a few weeks. And then we saw the same people who were saying, let's be kind, we're all in this together. Start saying things like, I can't believe you and your family are spending your time to do this. You should be doing that. We saw people saying things like, you shouldn't post this. 
You're ignorant. And far worse things were said. And we saw the same people who were leaders in unity one second become leaders in division the next. I wonder if the world could tell the difference between those who followed Jesus and those who didn't. I wonder what the difference was. We do not want to look to the world to see how to act, how to post online, how to comment. The world's standards are always changing. And if our standards of how to treat people are the same standards as the world's, then our standards are too low. Jesus has given us a higher standard and we want to know what he is like. We want to know his words, his ways. We want to have his perspective. And from that place, we want to live like Jesus would live. We want to love people like Jesus would love people if he were in our shoes. We want to speak to people like Jesus would speak to people in 2020. I don't want to just move like the world moves. I don't want to just repost what the world tells me to repost. I don't want to just love what the world tells me to love or like what the world tells me to like. When I made Jesus the Lord and leader of my life, when I just said, when I said, I'm going to follow you and look like you, I made a decision. I'm going to love what God loves and I'm going to hate what God hates. And you may be sitting at home or listening to this on the podcast and thinking, well, God does not hate. And that sounds so sweet and spiritual, but that is not biblical. Proverbs 6, 16 and 19 tells us this. Take note. Take note, there are six things the eternal hates. No make it seven he abhors, eyes that look down on others a tongue that can't be trusted, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that conceives evil plans, feet that sprint toward evil, and a false witness who breathes out lies, and anyone who stirs up trouble among the faithful. These are the things that God hates. God loves everyone. But because God loves everyone, he cannot love everything because some things hurt the ones that he loves. And we've heard it said before that love is not a feeling. Love is an action. That means then that there are times where we are showing no action, where we are not living in love. And we don't want to be a church known for our feelings. We want to be a church known for our love which means we have to be a church of action. So how do we know how to actively love what God loves? Let's look at this verse in Proverbs 6 and see what God hates and see how we can flip it to see what God loves. If God hates eyes that look down on others, then he must love when we value others and when we actively lift others up. If God hates a tongue that can't be trusted, then he must love it when we tell the truth and are honest with ourselves and with others. If God hates hands that shed innocent blood, then God must love it when our hands and our actions and our words are used to prevent innocent blood from ever being shed. If God hates a heart that conceives evil plans and feet that sprint towards evil, he must love hearts that come up with godly plans, healing plans, and feet that sprint towards whatever brings people closer to Jesus. If God hates a false witness who breathes out lies and anyone who stirs up trouble among the faithful, he must love a witness of the truth, someone who says what God says and goes out of their way to unify God's children. So how can I have a faith that actively respects everyone. I want to love what God loves. I want to hate what God hates. I want to love what God loves. I want to hate what God hates. Jesus has always had a clear mission. Jesus came into a broken, divided world with a mission of healing, wholeness, and unity. And if we have chosen Jesus as the leader, the number one in our lives, then we are also a part of Jesus's mission for wholeness, healing, and unity. That's what it would look like to live on the Jesus mission. 
And in recent months, it has been highlighted the serious pain our black brothers and sisters have been going through for hundreds of years and are still going through. And it's wrong. It must end. Racism is a sin from the pits of hell. And the Bible is clear on that. And Jesus is clear on that. So for those of us who have chosen Jesus, we're standing here in 2020 thinking, how can I be a part of the solution? How can I be a part of Jesus's mission practically? I recently had a conversation with one of my friends who is so passionate about being on the Jesus mission. And she said to me, there's so many things I know I need to learn. There's so many things I didn't know. I want to be part of the solution. But then she said, but there's so many things to do online. There's so many lists of books, list of documentaries, things to sign, things to fund, all these conversations I'm going to have to have, all these people I'm going to have to apologize to. And I said to her, which one have you done? And she said, none of them. I am overwhelmed. And maybe you have felt that way in these past few months. And church, I don't want us to be a church that is so overwhelmed by the various things to do that we don't do one thing. So how can I have a faith that actively respects everyone? I need to find my starting point. I need to find my starting point. And my starting point may not be your starting point. And it might not be the same starting point as the person next to you needs to start where theirs are. But I'm telling you right now, we need to have grace for each other. We need to have grace for ourselves. But we do all need our starting point. Maybe the starting point for you today is that you are going to look at the resources in our church app. I put a specific amount of resources in our church app that are great resources to start at. There's a couple books, there's a video, great places to start at. Maybe your starting point is committing today. I'm gonna commit to accessing one of these things this month. Maybe your starting point is that you're gonna text a friend right now and say, will you go on this journey with me? Maybe having a partner with you or a friend on this journey would help you be more accountable. Maybe your starting point is getting a friend and saying, will you go through this book with me? Or maybe your starting point is sitting with your family right now, right after this talk, sitting with your family and saying, okay guys, family meeting, do we have any questions about racism? Do we have any questions about what's happening in our world? Do we have any questions about our history of our nation and our family? Maybe that is your starting point. And speaking of family meetings, I wanna to speak to our church family right now. If you're visiting, I'm so glad that you're here. We're so glad that you're visiting us online or on the podcast, but really quick, I wanna have a family meeting and talk to our church network. I know that our church network is filled with many beautiful families from all over the world. We have so many incredible families from all over Asia, all over the Philippines, all over Latin America and Central America, all throughout Mexico, come on somebody, and South America, all throughout the Caribbean, Africa, the Middle East, all throughout Europe and all throughout Australia. We have family from all over the globe here in our church network. And depending on when your family came to this country, whether you're first generation, second, third, fourth, fifth generation, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth generation, we all come with our own lenses and our own experiences. And I know for many of us, because of the many different conversations I've had throughout our network these past few weeks, I know many of us are wondering, am I even a part of this conversation? So I just want to encourage you, as your third generation Chinese sister, as one of your pastors, I want to encourage our church family, no matter where we're from, or when our family came to this country, 100% of us can be a part of the solution. Jesus came with the clear mission to heal what was broken inside of us, to heal what was broken between us, and to heal what was broken between us and God. So if we have chosen Jesus as the Lord and leader of our lives, then 100% of us can be a part of Jesus's mission of restoration. He's calling all people, all ages, all races, all backgrounds, all hands on deck. I'm not saying that our past is the same past. And I'm not saying that our family's past or our ancestors' past 
past is the same past. I'm saying that we can work together for a better future and a better world that looks more like heaven will look like, where every tribe and every tongue and every nation will be together, worshiping our same creator together. No one is exempt. Jesus is calling for all of us to bring our bias, our favoritism, our prejudice, our sin to him. Recognize it, repent from it, turn towards Jesus and love what God loves and hate what God hates and find our starting point. And finally, after we find our starting point, we wanna find our specific part in the solution. I wanna find my specific part in the solution. I wanna find the way that I can be a part of this specifically. We wanna find our starting point and then we wanna find our specific part in the solution. I have shared many times with our church family about my upbringing. I grew up on the streets of San Francisco and we saw a lot of violence growing up and a lot of racism growing up and a lot of hatred and murder growing up. And I was nine years old, my baby brother was three the first time we saw someone killed in front of us. And that changed something inside of us. We had to mourn that. I hope that all the things that we're hearing and seeing about our other brothers and sisters in Christ are not making us numb or apathetic. I am hoping we're letting ourselves mourn that, grieve that and let God transform something in us because of that. And I remember the first time me and my brother saw this in front of us, it was overwhelming. And we have seen many acts of violence like that throughout our lives with different groups of people hating other groups of people. And not all of these situations are the exact same. And not all of the factors are the exact same. And not all of the sins and broken systems and lies from the enemy are the exact same amongst all of our friends that were in these situations. It can be overwhelming. There is so much brokenness in the world. How can we solve any of this? We can't solve it all on our own. We need to find our specific part in the solution. I made a decision at a young age. I committed my life to preaching the gospel of Jesus until the day I died. That was my specific part in the solution that I would use everything I've seen and everything I know from the streets, I would use it to speak truth to a world that's been lied to. That's my specific part in the solution. My baby brother, he specifically had a heart for all the boys in our hood that didn't have father figures that didn't have men in their lives. He became an inner city basketball coach. It was important to him that they had a big brother in their lives, that they had a coach cheering them on, telling them what they were capable of and being able to drive them back to their hood to have a ride home after the game and be safe. That was important to him. He found a specific part in the solution. My older sister became a social worker. And she has dedicated her whole life to making sure that kids are in families that are safe and loving and that they have the best shot they can. And you might hear all of these situations and think, well, what she's doing doesn't solve those problems. And what he's doing doesn't solve those problems. And what you're doing definitely doesn't solve all of those problems. And you are right. We're not solving every single problem, but we made a decision that I hope we all make. We will not be overwhelmed by the brokenness of our world so much to where we don't do anything. We will not be overwhelmed by all the various solutions in this world where we feel overwhelmed and exhausted to the point where we do nothing. No, we're gonna come to Jesus and say, my whole life is about following you. And my whole life is about being on the Jesus mission with you. How can I have my specific part in the solution? Maybe for you right now, what can be your specific part in the solution? Maybe you're a parent or you feel called to one day be a parent and your specific part in the solution is that you wanna raise children that love everybody the way that Jesus loves everybody from a young age. In fact, in the app, in our church app, I also put two books that are children's books that are resources for you. Maybe that's your starting point, but maybe it's also your specific part in the solution that you wanna raise children that love Jesus Jesus the way he would if he were in their shoes. Maybe you're an entrepreneur, you have a business, 
and your specific part in the solution is that you're going to look at and evaluate your company's systems and think, how can I make sure that I don't have favoritism, I don't have partiality, I don't have sin in how I have clients or how I have employees. I'm going to be an entrepreneur like Jesus would if he were in my shoes. Or maybe you're passionate about social media and your heart has broken for the ways you've seen other people talk to other children of God. And for you, your specific part in the solution is figuring out how to be a leader on social media, how to encourage people, how to speak to people differently on social media, lead your friends to do that with you. Maybe you wanna speak truth to a world that's been lied to digitally. I don't know what your specific part in the solution is, but we are a church that is committed to actively loving like Jesus would. So I hope you find your starting point this week. And I hope that in the upcoming weeks and for the rest of your life, you find your specific part in the solution. But right now, all across our church network, I'm gonna ask that we recognize and repent together. I want us to have a communal moment of repentance where we all across our network, no matter if you're watching on your phone or your computer, all of us together verbally repent from the way we've been living, the sin we've had in our hearts, the favoritism we've had in our hearts and communally repent and turn towards Jesus together. I'm gonna put this liturgical prayer up on the screens right behind me. And sometimes when I don't know how to pray or what to say, it helps me to, to read a prayer or read scripture And because it's so important to me that we pray this all together, I'm gonna ask that we read it together. Whatever the favoritism is in you, whatever the bias is in you, let's bring it to Jesus. And together, before our specific part, before our starting point, let's recognize and repent all as one church network. We're gonna read this out loud wherever you are, your whole family, all of us together. Let's come and repent to God together. Let's go. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Church, I am so glad that we were able to pray that prayer together. And if you need to come to Jesus and repent of some things in your own heart one-on-one this week, I encourage you to do that as soon as possible. Church, I am so looking forward to being on this Jesus mission alongside of you and actively loving our world well together. This is for the busted hearts. This is for the question marks. This is for the outcast soul lost control. No one knows. Sing it for the can't go back. Sing it for the broken past. Sing it for the just found out life is now upside down. If you're looking for hope tonight, raise your hand. For the loved in vain, overcame, it's not too late. If you're looking for hope tonight, raise your hand. If you're feeling alone and don't understand. If you're fighting in the fighting of life, then stand. We're gonna make it through this hand in hand.
with our differences. Together we are bolder, braver, stronger. One of the things I love the most is being connected to a family of churches. To be able to worship together corporately uh, is something that reflects, I think, the body of Christ in a way uh, that is so meaningful and super powerful. If at any point today during either Hosanna's talk or during the worship set, you just decided that you needed a new start with Jesus, I want to encourage you to share that news with somebody from our team. All you have to do is text new start to 67076 or maybe in the comment section if you're watching live on Facebook you could just text today I chose a new start and that will get you uh, a little bit of resources from us and our team and really just solidify maybe a decision you're making personally today I want to tell you as the pastor here at Torrey Pines Church I'm praying for you our team is with you and we can't wait to see what God does this week in all of our communities actively being the church. I love you. I'll talk to you on the next stream.